thank you. Um, greetings to everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of Nature Speaks. Nature Speaks is brought to you by Himalayan Nature and I'm him working for ZSL in Kathmandu, Nepal office. With me supporting this episode is Dr. Tulsi Subedi, co-host of this program and director of Himalayan Nature. This program is aimed at filling the gap on knowledge and connecting different generations of conservation practitioners in the field of expertise. Keeping up with our great tradition of having renowned scholars, this time we have invited a young and emerging Nepal's wildlife biologist. If I say that Baburam is one of the finest of our young scientists and somebody who gives hope to us, that conservation will be looked after well, even if we decide to take a back seat. It is indeed a great pleasure to have Dr. Baburam with us. Dr. Baburam Lamichane is a conservation biologist affiliated to National Trust for Nature Conservation, NTNC. For those of you not familiar with NTNC, it's a national organization that is mandated with a special legal framework to support government of Nepal, primarily through the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation in its various research, rescue and conservation activities. It was established in 1982 with its own act and currently operates in six lowland protected areas with its field offices, manages three conservation areas, as well as the only national zoo in Nepal, in Kathmandu. So through NTNC, Dr. Baburam has been involved in various wildlife conservation and research activities in the southern lowlands of Nepal since 2009. He completed his PhD on human carnivore interactions from the University of Antwerp, Belgium, and the Leiden University from the Netherlands. He has published over 40 peer-reviewed scientific articles on wildlife ecology and conservation. He's a very cool and calm, a very humble personality and destined to become Nepal's leading conservation biologist. Let's welcome Dr. Baburam. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for a nice introduction. Yeah, thank you for being uh, with us today, Dr. Baburam. Housekeeping rules. I just wanted to let everybody know that this session is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook. Regarding the presentation, if you'd like to ask any questions to Dr. Bagram, please do so through the chat options available just before the presentation is finished. I'll read them for Dr. Bagram to answer. As we are limited with time, we are able to pick up only a few questions. So I hope you understand that. Now let's start the presentation. Over to you, Dr. Bagram. Good afternoon, everybody. I will be uh, talking today about the tigers, uh, especially in the Tarayak landscape in Nepal, and then how the tigers are affecting the human communities or human tiger conflict, and then how we can mitigate that and uh, make it uh, or bring it to coexistence uh, between people and tiger. So for that, I'll start with the, um, what is a tiger? Uh, it is a exclusive carnivore of predator. It's a, in the Asian forest and uh, it's the largest member of the cat family among 41 species of the cat that are found in the world. And it is one of the loved creatures by people. So it is one of the charismatic people. Uh, uh, it's a wildlife that every, I'll say many people like uh, tigers, even uh, places where tigers are not found. It's also umbrella species. So protecting tiger means also protecting many other uh, wildlife uh, uh, in the lower trophic level. It is the top predator. So other uh, animals who are supporting in this uh, for the tigers are also uh, protected when they are protected. Then it's a uh, it's not only the from the ecological perspective, also, also also from the cultural perspective, tigers are uh, regarded as the uh, carrier or bahan of the goddess Durga. So, so it has a cultural significance, especially in Asia. 
And another important aspect is uh, the tiger is here since two million years ago. Tigers were uh, was uh, tiger was involved evolved two million years ago and entirely in Asian species. And Asia is land of tigers. Tigers are here before people arrive. There are many movement of the people. They say it's indigenous people, but actually tigers are indigenous for this uh, Asian region. So uh, just an overview. Uh, there are various uh, subspecies of the tigers, uh, nine of them, three were already extinct and six uh, are extinct, they are uh, here, but still uh, out of six, one is near to extinct. This uh, also you can see in this uh, picture, South China tiger who is functionally extinct from the wild, but uh, still in the captivity. And then Sumatran, Siberian, Malayan, Indo-Chinese and Royal Bengal. And the tiger that is found in uh, uh, this Tarayak landscape in Nepal, India, and uh, this Indian subcontinent is this Royal Bengal tiger. Uh, less than 4,000 of them are remaining in the wild based on the 2016 estimate. And uh, they exist only in 13 range countries, but uh, recent surveys in uh, Cambodia and uh, Vietnam shows maybe there are no tigers left anymore. So maybe this uh, uh, range country is also reduced to 11. Um, so it's a, a, a great challenge of uh, protecting them. The, what is the crisis of tigers? Their range collapsed globally uh, by 93%, nearly 93%, and they are confined to the, only the 7% 7, uh, 7 of their range. In this map, the yellow a uh, light yellow part is the historic range and the green part is the area where they exist now. So it's a, really a crisis for tiger. That's why all the tiger range countries uh, came together with this uh, ambitious plan to, to recover the tiger population uh, with this uh, and formulated this global tiger recovery program for doubling the tigers by 2022. 2010, is a Chinese year of uh, tiger. And then after 12 years, 2022 is another year of tiger in Chinese calendar. So uh, the tiger range countries came together and committed for uh, protecting the tigers and doubling its wild population. And there is some progress uh, since 2010, uh, the, the global tiger population was estimated uh, something uh, uh, below around uh, 3,200 and in 2016, uh, the population was estimated something nearly 3,900. Uh, but still there are problems in many countries. In some countries, they are doing quite good, but in many countries still there is a problem. To conserve the tiger, it requires a large habitats. They are la large ranging species and conserving in small uh, pockets or a small uh, part is not uh, uh, it's not sustainable, so uh, conserving them requires large landscapes. So there are uh, uh, landscapes uh, identified. One of them uh, is this Tarayak landscape, uh, which holds nearly 20% of the tiger population in the world. So thus, this Tarayak landscape uh, is uh, lies in India and Nepal, uh, in west of the Bagmati River and uh, up to the Emuna River in India. Uh, all the tigers that are, exist in Nepal for, uh, come in, inside this uh, Tarayak landscape. They are from this Tarayak landscape. Uh, there are five national parks where these tigers exist. Uh, as a tiger habitat, Tal is it's quite unique and it has a quite a high density of tigers as well as very high density of the people also. So that's why it makes a human dominated landscape. That's what I call this human dominated, I call it human dominated landscape. It lies in the Himalayan foothills uh, of the Churia and the Shualiks, uh, Dun Valleys and Gangetic floodplains of Tarai. Yeah, as I already mentioned about 20% of the global population lies in this uh, landscape, densely populated. And one of the priority landscapes supporting five out of 42 source sites of the tiger globally. So uh, these are Chiton, Parsa, Banke, Gordia, Dudua, Kishanpur, Sukhlafmata, Razaji, and Corbett. Uh, 
not only from the, that perspective of the tiger population, but also from the perspective of this uh, tiger study. This is uh, this is important place because the pioneer tiger study with the uh, ecological study with radio coloring of wild tigers was started in 1973. And then there there were many tigers, more than 20 tigers radio colored. Then monitored for generations, especially basic ecology. Uh, home range, social organization, uh, dispersal, prey species, etc. Um, in this uh, Tarayak landscape, recent estimate, 2018-19 uh, estimate uh, combination of India and Nepal uh, is 981. And uh, within the, that, uh, out of that 981, 459 comes from the transboundary Nepal-India side. So, uh, Nepal has this high protected area where the national park where there are tigers and uh, all of them are connected uh, through uh, corridors, biological corridors to the Indian parks and the combined population is 459. In Nepal, uh, the tiger population, the largest tiger population uh, is uh, Chitwan in the eastern side here, uh, 93 and then uh, uh, east of Chitwan, uh, uh, the Parsa National Park, which has 18 tigers, then 21 in Banke, 87 in Bardia, and 16 in Suklafata. So total tiger population in Nepal is 300, uh, 235 uh, based on 2018 survey. And uh, the density of the tiger is not even in some places, it's less than one, uh, but in some places like Corbett uh, uh, in India, up to 14 tigers per 100 square kilometer. And uh, in uh, Nepal, we have uh, about five tigers per 100 square kilometer in Bardia and uh, nearly four tigers uh, per 100 square kilometer in Chitwan. So Bardia, based on 2018 survey, Bardia density is more than Chitwan uh, tiger density. Uh, the good thing uh, we, we can see in this Tarayak landscape is tiger population is gradually increasing. So this uh, graph shows how tiger population is increasing in India and in Nepal. Uh, the Nepal's population estimate comes from first uh, national survey was done in 2008-9, 121. Then the second survey was done in 2013, 198 tigers and uh, 2018, uh, 235 tigers. So we can clearly see the uh, increasing trend here and Nepal is very close to its uh, target of uh, doubling the tigers. The uh, target is 250 for 2022 and 235 tigers were there in uh, 2018. And in India side also in the Tal, in Tarayag, it's uh, increasing. It's uh, going very uh, good population increase. Uh, we also have this transboundary uh, cooperation on the tiger uh, conservation uh, and research also. Uh, this uh, report, particular report was uh, prepared in 2014 based on the uh, tiger survey done in India and Nepal in 2013. And it found 10 tigers that were using the transboundary habitats both in India and Nepal. Out of them, four were in Chiton Valmiki uh, in the eastern side, then four were in Bardia Kataniagat uh, in western part and then two tigers between Sukulafata and Pilevit. And also there are, there are additional three tigers that were uh, during our uh, additional camera trapping and research work we found common between in India that's coming and going from India and Nepal. So we can see the more transboundary movement of the tigers because they don't know the boundary, political boundary. Uh, and also um, the tiger occupancy in Nepal Tal is increasing. Uh, as you can see in this figure, uh, based on these three national surveys done in 2009, 2013, and 2018. Uh, in 2009, only 36% of the habitat were occupied, and in 13, uh, six, 55, and in 18, 68%. So we can see gradual increase in uh, tiger occupancy across this uh, Parai arc uh, in Nepal. And uh, recently, uh, we, uh, in, uh, not recently, it's already two years actually, uh, 
we surveyed entire Surya region, Surya range, which is just north of this Tarai in the, um, um, through the camera trapping uh, for assessment of the biodiversity in that area. And we got uh, two tigers in between this Bardia and Chitwan uh, Parsa population, one male and one female. Uh, the male tiger in the, the figure, as you can see here, is about 100 kilometer away from the nearest uh, tiger capture in the uh, in in Baki. and then uh, the other female, the three dots, all from the, this female tiger, uh, about 50 kilometer away from the Chiton population. We assume it's not the proven because the photo we couldn't match the individual photos, but uh, based on the movement, uh, location, and direction, and also one. Uh, incident of the conflict of this female tiger uh, between this Chitwan and uh, the current, currently recorded location. There was one case, uh, one woman was attacked by tiger and our team uh, found that it was a female tiger, but we didn't get the photograph at that time. Uh, so probably the, she moved from Chitwan to that area based on that uh, we assumed and the other probably had come from the west. That means there is possibility of this uh, connect, connecting these two tiger populations through the natural uh, forest. So this whole concept of Tarai Arc landscape was started in uh, 2001 in Nepal, uh, just uh, connecting this tiger population. And Chitomono and, uh, uh, Chitomono and Bardia population, we used to think these are separated for a long time and maybe there is very less chance that uh, natural connectivity exists. But our record in between these two tiger population uh, give some hope for us that we can actually, if we work uh, uh, good uh, in protection of the, this uh, natural connectivity, tigers will use these areas and then probably the, there, there will be connectivity between them. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned about this, uh, uh, we are very close to the target of uh, doubling the tigers. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, these uh, tigers are like uh, fully protected and there is no challenges, but there are various uh, challenges still there and threats uh, for the tigers, especially um, for uh, the habitat uh, uh, degradation and loss in, in terms of this uh, linear infrastructure. Nepal is now uh, in the phase of uh, development and a lot of uh, infrastructure development projects are planned in coming years and that may if they are not built in a friendly way, environmental friendly, tiger friendly way, then probably they can affect uh, the tiger population or increasing tiger population. Uh, then encroachment also, especially in the forest corridors and then uh, sand, uh, resource extraction like sand gravel, and then habitat degradation, especially the wetlands and grasslands shrinkage is another uh, problem for tiger conservation and all overall wildlife conservation. Then uh, also uh, the grazing lands uh, is part of the uh, grassland sinkies. They are also disappearing in the protected areas. So uh, poaching and illegal trade, although in recent years, Nepal has been very successful in controlling uh, uh, the uh, poaching, but uh, the threat is always there. Uh, decreasing prey base uh, density, actually uh, the, based on our recent study in Chitwan, the carrying capacity is still um, um, that the Chitwan Parsa complex still can hold uh, uh, more tigers uh, based on our prey base survey. But, uh, in, especially in the outside of the protected area system, this prey base density is very low. And then uh, conflict uh, with the communities or human welfare wildlife conflict is another issue, then disease may be in the, uh, affecting the population. We have very less knowledge on uh, wildlife health. And then uh, also the changing climate may affect this large changing species. Uh, as my topic also includes this uh, conflict, so I want to go a little bit detail on the conflict side, uh, especially the how tigers are affecting people, generally injury, uh, attacking uh, humans sometimes injury or sometimes death. And then also livestock depredation, in, in the, especially in the fringe areas. And then uh, sometimes people also do retaliatory killing. And uh, the most uh, uh, pressing uh, challenge is that uh, there is negative attitude of people towards conservation 
of wildlife if there is conflict. So um, um, based on the this uh, conflict causing uh, tigers or uh, the tiger, human tiger conflict in Chitwan, uh, I conducted this uh, study if uh, there is particular group of the tigers that are actually causing a problem. So most, uh, many of these uh, conflict studies are from the social perspective and a uh, few are from the, the, the perspective of the tigers or the biology of the biological aspect of the tigers. So I try to understand if there are some specific group of the tigers that are coming and causing problem to the people. So uh, this is the finding of the result is already published in this in the form of a research article. So if you are interested, you can go in detail here also. I'll just summarize what I found based on this study. So for that, I, uh, we, we collected the records of the problem causing tigers in and around Chiton National Park uh, from the, our veterinary team and then also the, uh, this NTNC as a uh, uh, are already introduced is also involved in wildlife rescue and uh, research acti uh, activities here and uh, we compile all the records of the uh, record of these uh, rescue tigers. And also we uh, compiled the characteristics of this tiger, age, sex, morphology, and territorial behavior. And uh, we have this uh, camera trap record of the tigers uh, from Chitwan uh, since 2009. Like we had three different sessions of the tiger camera trapping. And also in between, we have some opportunistic camera trapping surveys. From that, we compiled the photograph of the, all the tigers to represent the tiger population and compare these individuals which were in conflict with the source population. So which tiger in the source population is coming out and causing the problem, whether they are in, uh, uh, found in the source population or not. And then we, um, individual of the tigers can be identified from their uh, stripes. So uh, they, they, they are unique. Uh, for individuals, so uh, we can uh, identify each tigers looking at their photographs, comparing with each other, and then uh, age and sex was uh, identified based on the uh, looking at the photographs and also the records from the previous time. Then we estimated the age also, and then I uh, use this uh, binomial logistic regression to see if there are uh, different factors like age. Uh, sex, physical condition, and territory behavior, and their interaction has effect on the uh, this uh, conflict causing tigers. So we use this uh, stripe identification method to identify the tigers. And what I found uh, is that mostly tigers were in, involved uh, temporarily in conflict. So it's not uh, something like uh, we can say. Uh, uh, permanently conflict causing or it is a conflict causing tiger, problematic tiger. It can be problematic for that time and then or it can be a, a good tiger or in, in other way, not the problematic tiger or the tiger that is not coming into the conflict and remaining in the forest for a long time and then sometime some, after some changes in their territory or their uh, physical condition, then they can become problematic. So that is what I found. So uh, I compiled the record of 22 such conflict causing tiger um, between 2007 and 20, 2016. And uh, out of this 22, 60% of them were uh, removed from the, uh, their habitat. Uh, either uh, some were killed, some were uh, taken in and put in an enclosure. And, uh, that represents only less than 5% of the tiger population in the Chitwan. So that means out of um, this, uh, all the tiger population, 95% never cause problem with the people. Only the small portion of the tigers, which are either they don't have territories or dispersing or, uh, tigers from their natural territories, old or pushed out uh, animals, which are um, whose ter territory is taken by the other tigers and uh, transient tigers, some tigers who are looking for territory. So these are the, the main group, one group of the, the tigers or the characteristics of the tiger, I'll say, is uh, 
causes them to involve in the conflict or they come, come close to the human communities and cause problem. And then if they are physically challenged, injured, or they are, they are unable to hunt the wild prey, then they can come and cause problem with the humans. So uh, it's uh, uh, when we blame all tigers for conflict, then that will be, uh, we are blaming the wrong way. So because there are only a uh, small proportion of the tigers which are causing the problem and others never cause problem or they, they are not causing problem. Here is one example of a tiger uh, which was photographed in uh, Chitwan in uh, 2013 uh, in camera traps and uh, it was in healthy condition in core area and there was no, no report of the conflict where this tiger was photographed or the area in that area. In 2015, we detected uh, this tiger in very poor shape and we suspected that it may come and cause problem and that happened actually and then uh, the same year uh, it killed two persons and then we remove uh, we uh, capture this tiger and put it uh, into the enclosure um, so uh, this healthy tiger when it uh, became ill or it it, uh, it uh, injured and fight probably it had, it had a bad fight with other tiger and then um, lo lost its territory and then it it came into the conflict with humans so here is one example of uh, a tiger in Baranavar corridor forest, which is uh, north of the Chitwan National Park connecting to the uh, northern hill forest area. So this tiger, uh, in this photo, it's not visible, but there is one small video, video clip. I just want to play it. So as you can see in the video, the tiger is uh, walking, limping. So the tiger, something a problem in its hind foot on the uh, uh, left side and it cannot walk properly. Um, so this tiger, uh, we, uh, as you can see in the picture, 20, 2017 uh, October, this tiger we found in this uh, corridor and uh, we thought this may cause problem and we uh, um, informed to the communities nearby and then we said there is a tiger so be careful and uh, for some time we didn't find there was some reports of tigers coming into the there is one um, the dumping site near this uh, corridor and the, the, the people reported the tiger is coming close by in this area and then we informed that this can be a problematic tiger just be careful and uh, that actually worked well and uh, this tiger later recovered in we uh, photograph in healthy condition uh, without conflict uh, uh, incidents in the um, um, 2019, I think, in after one or two years or so. So that means not all uh, the tigers which are problematic need to uh, become conflict. So some uh, some tigers which are uh, we cannot adapt or sometimes they come close to the humans and accidentally attack humans and then they can become the conflict causing. So basically by nature, tigers try to avoid the uh, humans. Uh, and uh, this uh, map shows the, the locations of the tigers which were causing problem and also the locations uh, when they were captured inside the uh, national park in the camera trap when, uh, without con uh, causing problem. For instance, I want to just focus on this one tiger which was photographed inside the national park and uh, in uh, the year is 2000, I think the red one is like something 2013 um, or 2014, uh, yeah, 2013. And then it came into the this settlement area later and then caused a problem and then we, we removed this tiger. Uh, when it was inside the forest, obviously it doesn't cause conflict. And then only when it comes outside, uh, because of different factors, maybe of this losing the territory or dispersing uh, and looking for the territory, and then it started causing problem. So, uh, and uh, in Chitwan, uh, out of these uh, 22 uh, problem-causing tigers, uh, as I mentioned earlier also, uh, 
60% of them were uh, uh, removed or taken or uh, translocated. So there was uh, no, only one tiger was killed by the park authority in 2007 actually. And after that, there is no, uh, no tiger is killed, but all the tigers which cause problem are taken and put it in enclosure. And uh, no manager tiger is released in the wild, but uh, they are put in enclosure. And some of the released tigers also rehabilitate well. So here we can, I, I just want to focus in one uh, like uh, release in the wild. There are four tigers released in the wild. Out of four, two were just a safety threat and two were killing the livestock. And out of these four uh, tigers released in the wild, two rehabilitated well, but uh, two of them, uh, one died for sure we know and others, other we, I don't know. Uh, we don't know, uh, we don't have the information about the, the tiger. So uh, I want to tell this story of this uh, tiger released in the wild. What happens after releasing into the wild? Uh, there was one uh, tiger in, which was causing problem in this Madi Valley. Madi Valley is in the southern side of the Chitwan National Park uh, in the buffer zone area. And it was uh, there remaining in the near the settlement area, killing livestock and people informed us to remove this tiger. And then we uh, captured this tiger and released in um, like uh, inside the core area uh, in this uh, red dot released, uh, you can see in the map also. And uh, after uh, releasing, we thought it will rehabilitate inside the core area, it will stay there and then we will be happy, tiger will be happy, but it didn't happen. It uh, remained there. It didn't remain in this area, but uh, it uh, moved immediately towards north uh, west, and then it again went very close to the settlements and remained there for a week or so. And then after a uh, week, probably he figured out that I need to go to the my original place from that direction, and then he it, it went straight to the place where it was captured. And, uh, and uh, surprisingly, after going back to the same place, we were looking in the map, uh, tracking, but nobody reported any conflict in that area, like any incident of livestock killing or, they, the people didn't know that tiger is there, but tiger was remaining there for almost two weeks. And then finally, it, uh, then it make, uh, made a kill of, uh, uh, livestock or, or an ox and then then um, people again started saying oh problem tiger is there and then again our team went and then ca captured that tiger and then we, we released the tiger it's the movement close-up movement of this uh, for two weeks and uh, as you can see this tiger the uh, green part is forest and the white and gray part is the settlements. It was quite going, going through the, the settlement areas, but generally it's going to the other forest paths and then coming back like that. So after uh, uh, this uh, incident that we captured, I, we assumed that this tiger was probably surviving in this uh, area by eating um, some previous available in the forest, probably wild boar or, uh, or also sometimes maybe taking some dogs from the village because uh, if uh, they generally don't prefer the small prey, but if they don't have option, they also go for small prey, like dogs also. And uh, after we captured, then uh, we are, the government decided to move it uh, to other part, not in Chitwan, so because it makes us again problem in the same area. So we moved it to Bardia and uh, released in the core area of Bardia. We think, think that this remain, will remain inside the uh, park, it's uh, Babai Valley. The, the whole valley is uh, um, free of human settlement and it is uh, quite wild there. So we thought after releasing him, uh, this tiger there, then it will uh, adapt there and then we will we'll be happy and he will be happy. But um, again, the same thing, it uh, moved uh, in uh, first to the south and then we figured out it's not the direction I need to go and then turn back to the north and then went uh, very north and went outside of the park in just two to three weeks time like January 5 to January 16 it's just 
two weeks time and then we lost the tiger we don't know what happened after that because the collar stopped working but interestingly this is the second tiger we this is the second tiger we released in bardia in the same valley and uh, first tiger also were, had similar direction uh, in 2011 and uh, this is uh, in 2014 so we don't know why probably they feel threatened by the other uh, resident tigers inside the park and then they try to find places outside in the uh, fringe areas and this is the that's why this uh, tiger became like a pro conflict causing in the villages i think and um, um so this is the story of this tiger and uh, i just want to focus uh, so here how the um, incidents uh, of the human and livestock loss is uh, happening in Chitwan National Park uh, based on uh, this uh, data from the uh, compensation payments from the uh, this park record. So it shows uh, the human uh, the human attacks from the wildlife and not only tiger but also rhinos and elephants and others. And death and injury is not uh, uh, in uh, like it's fluctuating. So, uh, slightly declined but it's fluctuating over the years so it's not uh, we cannot see clear trend but it's more or less uh, similar if we compare from 1998 99 2000 and there was a peak uh, a bit of a spike in 2002 2003 at that time and then again it was uh, something like coming sometimes more sometimes less but uh, the, interestingly, the livestock depression has uh, decreased quite a lot and especially with the tigers, it has decreased. Probably there is a uh, change in changing the livelihood strategy, especially uh, livestock rearing practice, the livestock uh, grazing is banned in many places and people are keeping livestock in their stall. Maybe because of that, the, uh, the um, incidence of livestock depletion has decreased in uh, Chitwan over over like past uh, decade. Um, and then uh, there is a one um, in Bardia, the other uh, part in uh, western Tarai, other park which has uh, now very good population highest uh, density higher than tire uh, Chitwan based on recent survey in 2018. There is a spike in tiger attacks. In 2019 only there were cases of I think nine or ten cases of the one, two, three, four, five, something like eight cases in uh, Bardia, uh, like nine, uh, seven cases in Bardia and then two cases in Bardia district, but outside of the park, and then two cases in Bank and National Park. So, uh, if we look before, like 2018 till 2018, the uh, number of uh, attacks by tiger uh, on people was uh, very low, maybe one or two cases, but uh, it was sudden rise in 2019. Maybe the increasing tigers in Bardia, uh, and maybe some old or uh, some tigers, like uh, I mentioned earlier, which are looking for territory, maybe uh, going out and then causing this problem. So as tiger, uh, uh, Bardia tiger population has increased quite a lot in the last uh, five to seven years, uh, maybe we, we, we can expect maybe there will be more uh, incidents of conflict in, in Bardia. So it is a bit of a worrying thing. Okay, so coming to the how to develop the coexistence, um, that is also part of my PhD study, uh, if that is possible or not. And uh, I found that uh, many of the, uh, the conflict mitigation measures are looking from the either from the social perspective or from the biological perspective. And my uh, uh, study finding was that we need to combine the social and biological perspective to manage the the, this conflict. So first thing is we need to take care of the biological need of the tigers. They are territorial and long-ranging species and they have other competitors also. And they, uh, they need this uh, core protected areas where this uh, residential tigers can uh, remain with their territory and interaction zone or buffer zones and corridors so that this 
dispersing tigers those tigers which cannot find their territory in the park uh, can either go into the finding their territory or dispersed into the other places so that the conflict in that particular location is uh, less and then also maybe in future we need to think of the uh, assisted migration if the natural connectivity is not possible so then from the biological side of the tigers we can we can help uh, tigers and other wildlife similar other wildlife then another is a protect proactive management of conflict causing individuals as i also show, showed previously uh, shown previously that uh, the one tiger that was causing uh, that was in bad shape killed uh, two persons so if we have such, such tigers detected in the buffer zone and we quickly remove these tigers we can probably reduce the conflict um, here i'm i've given this one example of the Dhruve elephant also this elephant a single elephant killed more than 15 people but uh, other elephants i think the combined uh, other elephant in this chiton maybe killed less than that so this single one is main culprit um, for the causing the problem and uh, the same thing 95% of the tiger never causes conflict but only 5% that caused the problem monitoring tigers and other wildlife species especially in this interaction zone can help or can inform the uh, about this uh, movement of these animals or these uh, tigers capacity building of the local communities uh, on this uh, uh, tiger uh, monitoring and uh, conservation will be uh, also important and, and uh, conflict actually is a uh, is a uh, in my in the mind of people so increasing the social tolerance is also important because this, the, there the something happens or some incident happens whether call it conflict or not is in the people's mind so the avoiding human casualties should be the most uh, main priority because if a human is attacked or killed then um, there is no it is the ex extreme form so we need to uh, try to avoid this uh, to awareness uh, like changing the behaviors of the people also because if uh, people are most of these uh, attacks by human uh, wildlife are accidents i call it accident because uh, no animal or no, human is not the natural prey of any animal anyway even for the tigers Nepal, human is not the prey and uh, many other wildlife which cause a uh, uh, attack uh, humans in may, mostly the maxi uh, accidental attack so changing these behaviors can help alternative livelihood and early warning systems uh, may be also helpful and then timely and adaptive compensation for the loss especially for the uh, other than human causalities human causalities is a more sensitive issue because it, there is no compensation for human life enhancing social values of the wildlife of course this is important and then awareness related to behavior of the tiger how we need to um, behave when tigers are around or other wildlife is around because um, in many cases because of the people's behavior these animals are attacking people so uh, we need to uh, make people aware of that and supporting the family members of the victims if somebody uh, unfortunately lost their life or uh, um, is uh, attacked by the uh, wildlife there is one example i just want to share it's not from the wildlife field but uh, maybe useful we can uh, uh, you apply to to develop the coexistence it, it's a world uh, data i think uh, from the increasing cars and increasing accidents so the in the lower part you can see the number of uh, fatalities and the cars on the lower side i think cars in the millions or something and then there was uh, the increasing train and people were dying from the car accidents very high and everybody were worried and then these different policies were uh, practiced and licensed uh, the driver were licensed skilled and then the environment road is improved and all with all these improvements then car numbers are still increasing but accident number has gone quite down so this is a different example but maybe for um, wildlife also we need something similar we need to increase the wildlife population but without increasing the number of uh, conflict so 
uh, if we have uh, people who are not uh, hunting or which are uh, wildlife friendly farming and they can fund their prevention measures if there is some uh, wildlife damage they report that and then they comply with law they have alternative livelihood and then if the tigers or the wildlife is protected they have enough space they cannot access the crop or livestock and then separate it from people and, uh, and then uh, have a positive contribution to the li local livelihoods through tourism or other aspects then um, also the assets like uh, livestock and other assets are uh, separated from wildlife and they are guarded or fenced and then habitat is protected and managed according to the land use plan probably we can have the similar result with the increasing wildlife population but decreasing the conflict actually we can see some results from uh, the practice in chitwan also and uh, uh, here with the buffer zone and other initiatives in in nepal that we have increased the wildlife populations of rhino tiger uh, and others also rhino tiger i'm uh, taking here as the exam as an example and um, the proportion of the number of attacks people by these animals are actually decreasing uh, it's not in increasing in the proportion but less than the expected or you know, we can see this trend that uh, both are from the tiger and rhinos when there are more tigers or more rhinos we expect that it goes like this but actually it's not going that way but it is similar or slightly decreased so that shows that actually uh, we can create coexistence if we have right measures and we need to enhance these right measures so we need these core protected areas and then biological corridors to allow them for dispersal and then the buffer zone areas we call where interaction zone where these uh, uh, tigers or leopards or other wildlife can occasionally go and people are also using that area and then um, probably we can create the coexistence uh, thank you very much i i like to in here Sorry if I took a little bit of a longer time. Um, uh, I just want to say this last words here. The fate of the tiger is not in the hands of scientists, conservationists or managers, but on the society, how society views and values the tiger, what it is willing to pay and how it motivates the, it motivates the political will to conserve it. So, it's not in the hand of the conservationists or researchers or managers only, but it's actually on the society how we value the tiger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baburamji. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I, I certainly I learned quite a lot about uh, tigers today. You know, there's so many interesting things, and um, especially I like them. The, the fact when you said uh, there's a female tiger moving west of Chitwan and uh, there's a male tiger coming from Baldia, but wonder if they met, you know, <laughs> you know, wonder if we could uh, make some kind of uh, uh, cent center point dating place for them, you know, for them yeah. to do their thing. <laughs> it's amazing. What a, what a story. And, uh, so much of information. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Bagram. So um, if you allow, I will start taking questions. And because there are several questions um, on the board, I would like you to answer, you know, just give a short answer, uh, please. So the first question is from Marcus Cotton. Remember Marcus, once upon yeah. a time, when we both used to be teenager, he used to work for NTNC in the mid 80s. Uh -huh. Since uh, tigers yeah. are territorial, why release in the park and disrupt the territoriality of other resident tigers? What's the logic of tiger ecologist that, you know, these problem tigers are just, you know, taken and put in already in already somebody, you know, territory. So what's your... Yeah. What's your, uh, very much for this uh, yeah it is very interesting uh, yeah question or it's also a challenging question I say <laughs> uh, 
um, uh, the decision to release the tiger in Bardia was uh, made um, to to incorporate this uh, that uh, Bardia has less tiger at that time. Now it's quite large number, but uh, when we were releasing the tiger population in Bardia was around I think 50. And uh, the Bardia National Park area is um, bigger than Chitwan. And we thought the, uh, there is still uh, uh, space for the tigers in that area. That's why the decision was made to translocate uh, into Bardia. And uh, um, while uh, re releasing the problem tiger is a tricky thing. If we try to release in the like uh, habitats outside of the park where um, maybe we think the uh, species is available, then community will say, no, 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 this is, uh, you cannot release the tigers, it will cause problem to us. So the, I think the managers take uh, this decision. We, we only advise them like this, this is the situation. If we, even if we release, it will come out that what we call, but still uh, the managers think it is safe to release into the park. So I think that is also uh, a bit of a, management issue, uh, not, only the, uh, not only based on the scientific, uh, uh, um, what we call knowledge only. Thank, Thank you, uh, Baburam. Your um, really? um, Another question is from Nishan Baral. Actually, there are several questions. Um, so it will be good, you know, if uh, um, people writing questions can just have maybe just one question. Um, just one question. So he, he says, uh, uh, the two major threats to tiger, are, apart from anthropogenic factor, the tiger itself, and that is the cannibalism. Is there any chance, any case of such behavior in Nepal, tiger eating up its cubs? Does our carrying capacity research show any factor of influence on such behavior or is carrying capacity and cannibalisms independent of each other yeah and was there any was there any follow-up of Donald Dura tiger you know the tiger that climbed the hills yeah so many questions but please be, be brief Bagram. I, I think I okay. can only take it at this stage okay so uh, I, I'll try to briefly summarize this uh, cannibalism is a natural behavior of tiger so I will not call it threat it is a part of uh, making the genetic, uh, 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 maintaining the genetic diversity within the tiger population. Because uh, if there is a single male breeding all the time, then it will create the like a single gene only on that uh, population or that the gene of that tiger will be more dominant. But uh, if a uh, new tiger comes and then kills the uh, one, I will not say it's a good one, but it is also part of nature that uh, it, it will the tiger, the new tiger will also want to increase or uh, put his gene in this population. So uh, if the habitat is protected, the tigers are protected and uh, they are given the enough space and time, then they will easily breed. So it, it's not a uh, pro big problem. About carrying capacity, uh, we, uh, we have this uh, recent study in Chitwan Parsa complex and we found based on most of this uh, carrying capacity, of the carnivores are based on uh, prey density and prey density is quite enough uh, to support the existing tiger population even can increase based on prey. So, but uh, still there are issues of the territory and the space available and the shape of the park is also a bit of problem here because Chiton is quite elongated and narrow and that may be the problem of this uh, tigers causing conflict. And the other one about Donald Dura tiger uh, tiger can go up in mountains. It's not a new thing, but uh, for Nepal, it's new because we have not uh, recorded this before. And this is quite good that we got this tiger in 25, nearly 2,500 meters. And uh, there is follow-up study from WWF. Uh, NTNC, we are not involved in that study, so I don't have update on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that brief answer. Uh, some uh, questions are taking reference of uh, your slides. So, Gogendra Rayamaji uh, is um, asking with a reference to your 27th slide. Yeah. A larger area of Chitwan National Park seen without tiger presence. 
what 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 is the explanation there okay just i want to go 27 is, is it unsuitable habitat for tiger or it's prey what, what is the any other reason what's the explanation there um, uh, sorry for uh, because it was a limited time i couldn't explain everything the map on this uh, 27 slide was uh, the uh, uh, problem causing tigers only so it is not all tigers but uh, I compiled the uh, tigers that were causing problems to people and then uh, uh, made the, based on their uh, captured location from camera trap or they were reported in the village and then made this uh, uh, polygon, MCP polygon and then just show that uh, in the map. So it shows, uh, this map only shows where these problem causing tigers were uh, found or yeah. where they were operating. Thank you. I think that's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Dr. Sarala Khalim, uh, who you may remember. She was uh, one of the person implementing uh, TAL concepts and the design when she was here yeah. working for WWF. Her yeah. question is, TAL was a landscape design for tigers. Corridors yeah. were designed and endorsed by the government. Do they still have the potential to serve the purpose for which they were designed? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, this uh, tiger was captured in uh, photographed in between these two tiger population itself explains the uh, or gives an answer to your question. There is uh, still possibility and there is actually there is more evidence now that tigers can use this landscape. Not only this corridor but also we have record from uh, this Khata corridor that connects uh, Bardia with Indian Katarnia Ghat Wildlife Sanctuary. Then we have uh, also photograph of this tiger in Lal Zahari corridor in uh, Bardi, sorry, Kanchan Suklafata. Yeah, Suklafata. So I think this, uh, this shows that this tile, which was conceptually designed 20 years ago, is now functioning. So I, I can see that it is functioning now. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, so I think Sarla will be very happy. Dr. Sarla will be very happy to hear that. Um, the next question is uh, Naresh Kusi, our young biologist, again, another vibrant um, scientist, young scientist. Um, thank you for your insightful talk. How do you see the recent record of tiger in the Mahabharat range in the light of human felid, human Failed conflict given that the Middle region is already having a grave situation in connection to conflict with the leopards. Yes, uh, this is a challenging uh, uh, thing uh, to uh, make this tiger survive in uh, this uh, very um, fragmented habitat. Um, human uh, density is less in uh, hills but it's still highly fragmented. The habitat is highly fragmented and Privacy is very low and uh, tigers moving in these areas also puts pressure in leopards. So this is a, a bit challenging thing, but we need to work for increasing the privacy to sustain the tiger population. Otherwise, they will just go look, uh, maybe look around and then explore area and then, then come back. If uh, we have a good uh, established, good privacy, and then probably they will stay there uh, like in Bhutan. Thank you. Bipana um, Sahadev writing, thank you so much um, sir, for this wonderful presentation on the special occasion of Teacher's Day. There you go. Nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one curiosity on slide 33. So you'll have to, you know, revert sure, back yeah, to you. Yeah. 33. Is the source of graph the park records of five protected national parks of Thal area or it is only from Chitwan National Park. The source of the graph, is it? Yeah, it is from the Chitwan National Park only. And uh, this is also part of my study. Uh, I, also the published uh, record uh, in the, you know, one of the papers, you know, one of my chapters. So it is from Chitwan National Park only. Thank you. Hari Basnet is the director of Small Mammal Conservation and Research Foundation. Yes. Recently, tiger is moving in the higher elevation, which is not the home of typical tiger prey species. 
like spotted deer, samba, and gaur. Does barking deer and goral found in this altitude, uh, are they sufficient as a diet to tigers? Or do we need to prepare for more human type tiger conflict in the mid hills due to predation of domestic cattle? If tiger decides to stay there in the mid hills permanently? Uh, thank you, Hari. So this is, I think I also explained earlier that uh, we need to work for prey. Um, even uh, spotted deer is not the right size for tigers. You can imagine the tiger is uh, around 200 kg, the male even bigger, females 150. And then spotted deer is uh, um, just uh, 55 kg or something. So it's uh, like a uh, it's very small for tigers, even the spotted deer. If they find, they prefer samber. Many studies show that they prefer samber if they find. So that means even our uh, prey in our existing parks are not uh, very good for tiger. So in the hills, there's even smaller and it's not uh, optimum. But if there is no optimum, then tiger will go for less optimum also. They will survive, but uh, they will need more effort. And that means they can breed less frequently or their breeding success, survival or success will be less. So to increase the breeding success and make them more um, like uh, adaptable there, we, we need to either uh, prepare, uh, plan for bigger prey. I think summer can go into the hills also. And then, uh, or um, I don't know if Nilgai can go. Nilgai is also very good prey. If, can have there and if not then uh, conflict uh, can they, uh, they can go for livestock which is uh, already we have observed in, in Tarai but uh, generally if they find wild prey they will not go for livestock. Yes. Thank you um, Dr. Barbara. Um, uh, next question is from Prem Powdell. I think it's um, but it's, you know short answer. How many tigers estimate for Chitwan National Park, Parsa National Park, and Balmiki Tiger Reserve complex in 2020? So we 20, need, I think, 22 or no, 20. It's 2020. Okay. Uh, we uh, survey the tigers uh, every three to five years uh, in around four to five years uh, in entire habitat. So uh, we don't do annual surveys, so we don't have an uh, idea of exact how many tigers uh, in this uh, in 2020, but we have the latest survey from 2018, and that shows uh, Balmiki has 31, Porsa is 18, and Chiton has um, 93, and uh, total 111 in Chiton Porsa and 31 uh, in ba Bal sorry, Balmiki, so Balmiki. total is 11, 42, 142 tigers in this complex. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Bhavaram. The next question is from Amar Kumar. Do you think too many safari rides and vehicles at the same time push tigers deep into the forest in Chitwan? I was wondering this will increase territorial fights and lead to less tigers. So it's kind of impact of increased unmanaged tourism to tigers. Uh, I don't see that uh, in Chitwan because um, the tiger density is concentrated along the floodplain area where these safari rides are happening. So uh, the safari, the, it's uh, in Chitwan, the, uh, there is only a single route that goes from Kasara, Chitwan, sorry, Sauraha to Kasara and then Tiger Dogs and the, to the western part. And um, the impact of this single route, I think, is not that much uh, for the for the level of affecting population. Because the other large part of the undisturbed habitat is still exists just on the side of these roads. So yeah, I don't. Think it's a problem for Chitwan at the moment. Yeah, at, at the moment, I think it's okay. Huh? So the next question is from Manoj Pokhran. Namaste, sir. How do you see the possibility of extending and restoring tiger habitat? East of Pal, East of Pal in Nepal. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, uh, another interesting idea that uh, we are also thinking. 
and that's why we were very curiously looking at the tiger pic sorry pictures from the camera trap when we were doing this Surya survey across Nepal and in Sarlahi and then other uh, in the eastern side. Fortunately, we have uh, photographed some sloth bears which were not recorded before in that uh, Saptari Trijuga forest area, but we didn't find any tigers. And there was another study also from this uh, lady Terry, uh, Terry and their team, and they also didn't find tigers. But there is a uh, good habitat, some good uh, good forest in eastern part of the east so eastern side of the Tal also, uh, east of the Tal area also. So maybe in futures when tigers are dispersing, the density is increasing in this Chiton uh, Persa or this Tal area, and they will look for the additional habitats in the eastern side also. But at the moment, uh, we have not found any evidence. There is possibility. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Bhavram. Another question is from Shyam Saha. He is the management officer at the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation and a, a prospective PhD candidate on tigers. The inference that increasing tiger population do not have positive correlation with human tiger conflict might have happened because of the population might be far below the carrying capacity in the complex. Could you explain it? Uh, yes, uh, that, is, that could be the reason. Uh, uh, when we looked at this carrying capacity based on the prey availability, uh, the Chiton Parsa complex still can hold more tigers. Only uh, the problem is uh, the concentration of this prey and the high density of the prey is in the, along this floodplain area, which is very close to the human settlements. So if there is some tiger which are pushed out, then it will be immediately the settlement area. So that may be the reason of the, um, some conflict incidents. And uh, it's not the carrying capacity based, I think, at the moment. So we still have room for the growth, but uh, keeping this, uh, uh, what we call the space um, interaction uh, intact. Thank you. Um, next question is from Sandesh Gurung, another young biologist, raptor biologist from Nepal. He's very crazy about uh, birds of prey, you know, and it's yeah. good to have, we have some crazy scientists yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I know him, yeah. If, if we are near doubling the population of tiger, have we been able to increase the habitat of tiger? What about the intraspecific intra -specific competition between them for the territory? Is, isn't there any possibility of pushing the weaker one towards human areas, which can end up increasing tiger-human conflict rate? Yes, uh, your concern is very right. That's probably what's happening in Bardia, and we have already, I already presented one slide about increasing uh, spike or sudden spike of uh, tiger attacks on humans or tigers coming in causing problem. So uh, I think that's a, that's a possibility of intra-specific competition when tigers are uh, more than the weak ones obviously need to be pushed out. That's why I highlight the importance of this connectivity. In uh, our study in Parsa, we found that 40% of the tigers in Parsa came from Chitwan. So if Chitwan population is increasing and then they find a good habitat in Parsa, then they can easily disperse. Instead of coming into the village or settlement area, they can disperse out into the other parts. So I think this, that's why we need this interconnected habitats and that can help in managing this, this kind of problems. Thank you. Um, this one is from Vijay Chapagai. And um, he's writing, it's quite a long one actually, so I'll read it for you. Uh, it's picked up from the Facebook page. Bhavram sir, thank you for all your details. We can see all protected areas, national parks, have increasing number of tigers except Chitwan National Park. If I'm not wrong, 2010, we had 98 tigers and in, in Chitwan. And in 2013, we increased to 120. And coming to 2018, now I can see 97. So um, did you pick it up? 
uh, 2010, 98, 13, 120, yes, yes. 2018, 97. Can you please give us me some idea why this number is drastically fluctuating? It's a quite a long um, um, question. So yeah. I understand four-way transboundary tigers between India and Nepal. You also mentioned that Chitwan National Park has more carrying capacity, but numbers are decreasing. Is there any data related to poaching between 2013 and 2018? between these national accounts. Any natural death recorded? In short, why Chito National Park tiger populations are decreasing, seem to be decreasing? Yeah, this is a, a question we have uh, got quite a many times. And also from the stakeholders in Chitwan also, they think that they encounter frequently tigers more than in the past and then how the population estimate comes below or low than the past. So. To explain this, I think uh, the, this pop, uh, we need to look uh, on the tiger biology also. Tigers can have, uh, can increase, population can increase quickly if they are like more breeding females and then they breed uh, new tigers, like each female can give four cubs and then in two years there can be, if there are 20 tigers, there can be 80 new tigers just in two years time. And uh, then when they start disperse, because all tiger cannot remain there and they start disperse and then maybe there is a little bit of less and then again, it can uh, be more. So, so that can be some kind of fluctuation in the, in the tiger population. And another is Chiton is interconnected habitat with uh, uh, Parsa and uh, Balmiki and many of these tigers are also dispersing. We have the evidence for in the transboundary region, but we have more tigers that are going in Parsa area. We know that the, the data from the cam this camera trap pictures. So uh, maybe because of these uh, these factors, in particular time when we were surveying, we found uh, less tigers. Or also uh, our estimate in 2018 was based on more robust method, which get uh, more reliable results. Uh, and that may be uh, have a little bit uh, with this uh, methods also. And uh, uh, the density is similar. So uh, from the scientific perspective, there is not much change in tigers in Chitwan uh, in 2013 or 2018. Only the mean number that we got from the estimate is little less than what we expected. But I think it's a, it's a normal process. Thank you. Um, I will have a couple of more questions, um, excluding this one. Sailendra Sarma writes, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is only territory or some sort of physical problem cause tigers to become livestock eater or man eater? Is it possible that only physiological changes in their body leads them to become livestock eater or man eater? Okay, so uh, probably he uh, he meant to you mean uh, Sailendra, you mean to say, uh, I, I think he meant just the, the physical physically challenged. Yeah. So uh, in my study, I found mostly these uh, tigers who doesn't have this uh, territory are the the one major cause because when they don't have territory then they, they cannot fight in the, inside the uh, park or they, they cannot stay inside the park and they, ha they are forced to come out. And then when they come out, then it is, there is in, uh, chances of encounter with livestock. So I also um, uh, presented one uh, example of one tiger which was remaining there in the village area, in the village area for two weeks, but it was not causing problems. So they are not, particularly looking or going for the livestock, but when their opportunity arises, then they can walk, uh, kill the livestock. So maybe because of that, the, the problem is there, but I don't see any uh, psych, what is, is psychological, physiological changes. I don't see any physical, I think any physiological changes in their body uh, leads to the going or preferring after the livestock. Sometimes it can happen that the livestock is easy and they feel why not take livestock if it is easy to kill than going for wild which is difficult to cap, uh, uh, capture or kill. So 
sometimes some tigers can develop that habit, but we have not seen this kind of uh, uh, tigers here in Chitwan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barbaran. There's just a brief question, slide 40. Yeah. Are you suggesting fencing the parks? Okay. Um, yeah, this is... That, uh, that is from Marcus. Yeah, that is... Uh, uh, from the community perspective, they want fence. And uh, we established this buffer zone program to allow the animals to go freely into the, the, their habitats or from one place to other place. And if they don't find the place in the park, then they can go into the buffer zone. But uh, if we have uh, this frequent interaction of the wildlife coming and causing problem uh, to the people, then people will obviously have negative uh, uh, attitude and then they feel like, Although the park is there, we are only getting the negative impact. We are not getting benefits, especially the farming community. So their first preference is fences. And fences in a way is also good, but uh, problem is if some tiger comes out of the fence or some wildlife comes out of the fence and they cannot enter back. And then there is the problem uh, starts. So we have uh, rescued some such uh, leopards or tigers. We have already faced that problem. So, but uh, I don't see any other alternative than uh, fencing in these uh, areas, which are uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, the settlements are the areas where there is more uh, people's uh, loss, are losing a loss from the wildlife. So I think on that area, we need some fences and we need to open the corridors. So. Thank you. Um, uh, this is the last question from Bogendra Raimaji. Will we be able to manage the 5% of the problematic tigers? And again, as we are increasing the tiger numbers. So it's just a kind of uh, forecast of the scenario. 5% problematic tigers now, but what will happen in the future if we are trying to increase the number of tigers? Uh, yeah, I think we, we discussed this uh, also in the, the past uh, question with uh, Sam Saha and others that yeah. Uh, still, yeah. uh, the, based on the prey, we still have some space for increasing the, the tiger yeah. uh, population. But uh, from the this conflict tiger perspective, we need more vigil to be more vigilant or monitoring system to detect this. Because it's detecting which tiger is causing problem is also challenging. So if we have uh, uh, we tried some uh, some time to work with communities train them in the in the western side in the island area when this uh, one monitor was acting and uh, then we we were uh, putting uh, uh, these camera traps and then we asked communities themselves to check the cameras and if they see the tigers then inform the communities not to go there and then uh, 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 manage the the change the behavior of the people so that the yeah. is uh, reduced so we have some got some good results from there also yeah. i think we need that kind of mechanism to detect these uh, uh, tigers, even if we increase this five percent increase to seven percent, that doesn't sure. that, that is not a big deal if we have this system in place. System in place, that's right. Thank you, um, uh, Babaramji. Would you like to thank you anybody in uh, maybe 20 seconds? Otherwise, I'll just read a final uh, statement. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Seconds for uh, wonderful uh, like questions and discussion and showing all your interest and love to these tigers. Thank you very much. And thank you thank for you. providing this forum, Hemsar and Himalayan Nature. Yeah, thank you. So on behalf of the organizers and audience, I would like to thank um, our speaker, very distinguished young speaker, Dr. Babaram, for sharing your expertise in tigers. You are really uh, very wonderful tiger experts. You know, you also mentioned about other carnivores and the conservation. Your presentation has been very informative. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, we all learn quite a lot uh, from a presentation. There's a lot of messages to take home. Many thanks to our wonderful audience, you know, for joining us in this presentation and all the questions you raised to our expert um, today on today's episode. So those of you who joined us a bit late, please be reminded that the entire presentation will be available on 
Himalayan Nature's YouTube site. We'll be back with another presentation a week. So please follow Himalayan Nature's page to find out what's coming next. But today I would like to wish everybody goodbye and namaste. See you soon. Thank you.